Good morning, church. Danielle, Dr. Mark Smith, and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually uh, to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Mark, will you invoke God's blessings on this morning? Yes, for sure, Victor. Dear Lord, um, thank you for this chance that we can come together, learn about your Word, learn about this great sacrifice of yours, uh, to be able to study your word. Help us to embrace it, learn it. Help us to fill our, our, our lives with hope and, and faith and be able to share your message to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you. Well, this, uh, this week's Sabbath School lesson is titled, Jesus the perfect sacrifice, and it's a wonderful lesson. And I'm hoping that you have already reviewed it, reviewed it, and you can accompany us as we obviously discuss it. The memory text is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 14. What an incredible chapter that is, chapter 10. Verse 14, it says, For by one offering, he, in reference to Jesus, has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That is encouraging. So what does that really say? It says that the one sacrifice of Christ accomplishes that which the continual sacrifices of the priests could not, for they could not purge the conscience. You see, Jesus' sacrifice purifies the conscience from guilt. It removes guilt. When the sinner accepts by faith the benefits of that one sacrifice made by Jesus, he or she is accepted by God being counted as, as perfect because Christ, as our substitute, stands in our place. As a brief um, overview of this week's lesson, I chose to really develop a journey that I want you to accompany me a little bit. As the Sabbath afternoon lesson tells us, the idea that a man found guilty and executed on a cross should be worshiped as God was offensive to the ancient mind. You see, there isn't much reference to the cross in Roman literature. This shows their aversion to the idea. For the Jews, the law declared that a man impaled on a tree was cursed by God. Here is how the scripture states it. Deuteronomy chapter 21 verses 22 and 23 states, If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree... His body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. For he who is hanging is accursed of God. There is no other scene, no other event in all history that stirs human emotions and the imagination as Jesus Christ dying on a Roman cross with pierced hands, pierced feet, and a thorn crowd ad. This scene, this event, forever raises the question, why? Why was Jesus, the only sinless being the world has known, put to death as if he, he were a common criminal? Why was his death necessary? Why was he willing to die? Why did God permit his life to be taken? What did his death accomplish? Death entered the world as a result of sin. The first death is a consequence of death passing upon all human sinners, for we are all sinners. The second death, however which is the eternal death, is to be the penalty for each individual's sins. 
Either we must die or someone else has to die in our place. Jesus Christ came to this world to take our place and carry out God's plan to eliminate sin and death. This plan makes provision not only to destroy sin and death, but also to restore mankind, human beings, you and I, to the oneness with God that Adam and Eve enjoyed before their sin. You see, the plan for men's salvation was not an afterthought merely to meet an emergency. In his perfect knowledge, God was aware that mankind would sin. And so before he created Adam and Eve, he made provision to safeguard men's eternal future. You see, before this world was made, the plan was laid to restore to sonship those who accepted the plan's provision. Let's go to Scripture. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, that God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. Almost immediately after the first sin took place, the plan was announced to Adam and Eve. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3, verses 15, and I know that you and I know this verse pretty well, as follows. I will put enmity between you, and he's referring to the devil, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, which happens to be Jesus' seed. He, Jesus, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Century later, later the prophet Isaiah pro prophesies how Jesus Christ would come to bear our sins. Let's look at it. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4, 5, and 6 tells us, Surely he, Jesus, was born, has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are ill. Verse 6. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This, this prediction, this prophecy was totally fulfilled. When Jesus was ready to begin his ministry, John the Baptist pointed to him. In John chapter 1, verses 29, it tells us that the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is Jesus. You see, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 22 makes it clear that the substitutionary death of Jesus is necessary to save us because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Blood stands for the life of the substitute. The demand that the transgressor die was fulfilled by Jesus, who died once for all as an infinite sacrifice for all humanity. It is true that the cross conveyed a sense of defeat and shame. Yet it was the cross that became the emblem of Christianity. The message of the cross is the gospel and the power of God. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This week, we will look at the cross as it appears in the book of Hebrew, and at Jesus as the perfect sacrifice. Danielle, why are sacrifices necessary? So that is Sunday's lesson and that we're going to focus on. Now, at first, I mean, we can answer very simplistically. 
but really we have to remember that we are in the book of Hebrews and we're looking at answers and explanations through the book of Hebrew. So why are sacrifices needed? We're looking from the perspective of Hebrews 9.15. So let's review that text together. And for this reason, he, with capital H, in other words, Christ, is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So that's how we are honing in on the answer for this. Like from this perspective, when we're looking at the covenant, the old covenant and the new covenant, why were sacrifices needed? And you know, when, when it says in here, it states that Christ is the mediator of the covenant by means of his death. So that's a clue. So then we are doing some research. Um, ancient covenants were of two kinds those between equals and those between lords and vessels. In a covenant between equals, there was sort of a mutual agreement uh, on conditions, privileges, and responsibilities. And we see such an example in Genesis 21, 31 to 33. I have two examples, but I think we'll read only one so we can focus on the important part of our lesson. But let's look at Genesis 21, 31, 33. And as we're reading, keeping in mind that this is a covenant between equals that we're looking at. Therefore, he called that place Beersheba because the two of them swore an oath there. Thus, they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose with Picol, the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of Philistines. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. So we see this agreement between Abraham and this uh, Abimelech, and we can see that it's just... They made, came to an agreement, they had sort of like a feast, and then they, they planted a tamarisk tree and they went on their way. And so is there another example with Isaac, uh, because this was an agreement between equals. But when there's a covenant, which is really an agreement, but it's a, um, more than an agreement, it's a promise between a lord and a vassal, a conqueror and conquered, superior and inferior, the lord or the conqueror specifies the conditions, privileges, responsibilities of both parties, and the vassal or the subject nation submitted to the conditions imposed upon it. So it wasn't something they had a choice. So throughout scripture, however, the term covenant most commonly describes the former relationship that exists between God and Israel and the chosen people, or the Christians of today too. Obviously, this was not a covenant between equals, but between the infinite God and the finite men. God himself determined the provisions of the covenant, made them known to his people, and gave them the choice of accepting or rejecting uh, the covenant. Once ratified, however, it was considered binding upon God and his people. So it wasn't just binding on the people, but also on God. And the writers of Hebrews refer to the covenant with ancient Israel as the, the first, so it, it, or the old covenant, and that with Christian believers as the second or new. Essentially, the same agreement between two parties. And we remember that it actually was established at first, really communicated to the entire plan of salvation, which is in a way part of the old and the new covenant was really communicated to Adam and Eve. Maybe not in great detail, but in substance. So in the ancient Near East, now we're coming to look a little bit of the actual question that we had in our lesson, why were sacrifices needed? In the Near East, a covenant between a lord and a vassal was a very serious uh, matter. Often they were ratified through a sacrifice of an animal. When God made a covenant with Abraham, so this was between God and Abraham, the ceremony involved cutting an animal in half. The parties walked between the parts or acknowledged that those animals represented the fate of the party who broke the covenant. So we see in this example, and this is it's, it's in Genesis 15, uh, 6 through 21. I don't think I have it, but you can study it on your own. And that's really what happened is God made a promise 
to Abraham that he was going to be the inheritance of uh, the, the future nation that the Israelites were going to occupy and that he was going to multiply and his seed was going to sp spread throughout the world. And in that promise, Abraham had to die, cut an animal in two and then they did this whole routine and God actually walked through between the animals as a showing that he was serious and promised it was his promise so this is the first example that we kind of saw in scripture of the animals and the sacrifice needed it was sort of a way of ratifying the covenant um, I have uh, Genesis 15 9 to 10 so that we can look a little bit of that it says and it gives us part of that story. So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him, cut them in two, down in the middle, and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And then we jump on to Genesis 15, 17 through 18, and here it is where God, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. So the burning torch was like a representation of God, the fire passing through because he did not appear in actual. Right. On the same, so on the same day, then significantly only God walked between the animals for the purpose of communicating to Abraham that he would not break his promise. When God made first, the first covenant with the Israelite nation, it also involved blood and sacrifice. And we saw that in Exodus 24, 3 with, to 8. Now, I'm not going to read all of that. I'm, but in, they also, you know, with the Institute of Sacrifice, sacrificial system. Now, the covenant... Um, that God made with Israel was going to provide them access to the promised land as their inheritance. It involved, however, the Ten Commandments. They were promising they were going to keep that. And the sprinkling of blood upon the altar. The sprinkling implied the destiny of the party who broke the covenant. So we can see that the sacrifice and the blood was all a matter of promise and a matter of consequences, like an understanding of consequences and the promise. That is why Hebrews 9.22 states that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. When Israel broke the covenant, God faced a painful dilemma, the death of the transgressors, but God loved his people. Instead of the death of the transgressors, the Son of God offered himself as a substitute. So again, the Son of God offered himself as a substitute instead of the death of the transgressor. He was going to uphold the sanctity of his law while at the same time saving those who broke the law. And he could do this only through the cross. Amen. The Son of God, the true sacrifice. Mark, um, in Monday's lesson, it describes diverse kinds of sacrifices that went through. Yep. Unpack that for us. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, and, and as we talked about in the Old Testament in Leviticus, we're going to dig into that. There was really five different types of animal sacrifices, and we're going to learn how these Israelite animal sacrifices described in Leviticus point to this ultimate one-time sacrifice that, of Jesus on the cross. But we're going to also dig a little further. We're going to see how the impact of this ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, and we can learn and see all the things that it gives us through um, Leviticus, the, these uh, sacrifices that are described in Leviticus. But before that, I wanted to kind of bring a prayer that Paul did to the Ephesians. And we're going to read about what really Paul is trying to see. I want you to read it. As I read this, think about what he wants us to do, know in this relationship with Jesus. For this reason, I bow my, and this is Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 19. Mm -hmm. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being routed, rooted and grounded in love may be uh, may be able to comprehend with all the saints 
What is the width and the length and the depth and the height? To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. What Paul is saying is that he wants us to know Christ in and out. And we're going to look at these sacrifices and let's see what are those things that um, the, these sacrifices of these animal sacrifices help us to understand and get replaced by this one time sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The first one is Leviticus 1, which is the burnt offering. And this is an offering that was given for the whole animal to consumed on the altar. Everything was burned up. The meat effectively went to, to the Lord. And this represents Jesus. It represents his life that was consumed for us. Jesus was equal to God, but gave everything for us as because that was the only way that we could that that we could uh, be that we could help this covenant was if God forgave us, and He did that. Let's read in Philippians two verses five through eight uh, a little bit more about this particular type, this version of the burnt offering, and how it relates to Jesus Christ. Let this mind in you, which in which is also in Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery or equal to God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming to the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Amen. Burnt offering showing how Jesus consumed his life for us. The second one is a grain offering. And this was a gift of gratitude for God's provisions of substance for his people. And this comes out of Leviticus, Leviticus 2. And we know Jesus is the bread of life. Simply that. In John verses 6 verses 35 shows us. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. The third type of sacrifice in Leviticus is a peace or fellowship offering. And this was given as a sacrificial meal with friends and family to celebrate the well-being provided by God. Once again, Jesus' sacrifice brings us peace. Isaiah 53, uh, I think Victor, I mentioned it, 53 verses 5, talks about Isaiah's prophecy. Um, and it shows here, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. Romans 5 verses 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have, pay, faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Or simply, John verses, chapter 6 verses 51 to 56 really comes out and says, I am the living bread, when we know all this, that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give in my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And I could read on, but there's, that is effectively it. Leviticus 3, this peace offering was, Jesus is the, 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 um, the, you know, the, the living sacrifice of that that he gave one time. The fourth uh, sacrifice is a sin or purification offering. And this is, comes out of Leviticus 4, and it's provided as an expiation of sins. The sacrifice is, emphasizes the role of the blood of the animal, um, representing its life to provide a redemption from sin. In fact, Leviticus 17 verses 11 points it out very nicely. It says this, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. We're reading Hebrews, and let's see what Hebrews says specifically relating to this type of sacrifice and how Jesus is so perfect. Hebrews 9, verses 11 through 14. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made by hands, that is, not of this creation, nor not with the blood of goats or of calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and of ashes and of heifers sprinkling the unclean 
sanctifies for the purification of faith, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your consciousness from the dead works to serve the living God? And there are other scriptures in the, the, the New Testament, but for time I will, I will I'll skip those. And the last offering that was described in Leviticus is our guilt or reparation offering. And, and I'm going to read out of Leviticus. Uh, this is chapter 5, verses 14, and, and talk about what this was there for. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, If a person commits a trespass and sins unintentionally to the regard of the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring to the Lord as his trespass, offering a ram without blemish from the flocks, um, with your value in shackles of silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, or, a trespass, or as a trespass offering. And he shall make restitution for the harm that he has done in regard to the holy thing. And he shall add one-fifth of it and give it to the priest, so the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering, and it shall be given him. Simply, you know, Jesus paid all our debts with the sacrifice. Absolutely. Everything that was done, the things that we could never do, as, as Daniel pointed out, he did for us only through his, Christ, his sacrifice. The sanctuary sacrifices show us that the experience of salvation mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ starts with knowing and believing in him, feeding on him, on his knowledge and his, his, his love, sharing his benefits of, with others, and providing re reparations for those who, whom we have wronged. Thanks, Victor. Amen. Thanks so much, Mark. And, and this is a, a good intro into Tuesday's lesson, because what, what Mark has just painted, really, is the pathway to Jesus' sacrifice, which is really perfect. And that's Amen. what uh, Tuesday's lesson is all about. So I'm going to invite you to, uh, let's go to Scripture. Let's, let's read a... Um, chapter 7, verses 27 of Hebrews, and then we're going to read um, uh, chapter 10, verses 10, 12 to 14 of Hebrews. This, for me, describes Jesus' sacrifice as being perfect. So let's start with chapter 7, verses 27. Jesus does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's sins. For this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10, 12, 13, 14, we read, by that will, and we're talking about God's will. You see, Jesus came to do God's will. So by God's will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Verse 10. Verse 12 tells us, but Jesus after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 13, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstools. Oh, this is an incredible statement. I, I don't have time to really explain that. But in, in, in verse 14 it says, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So the question for you and for me this morning is this. What is the significance of Christ's death? So what makes Jesus Christ on the cross perfect? Well, in the first place, from my particular perspective, I believe that Christ's death was vicarious. So what does that mean? A vicarious act is one performed by one person instead of and in behalf of another person. Christ died in the place of all human beings, in, in your place, in my place, and his sacrifice is eff effectual for anyone who chooses to accept him as a substitute. This means that the sacrifice of Christ provides full and complete atonement for the sins of the world, for your sins and for my sins. Here is how scripture describes it. Now let's, let's go to John, to, to the New Testament. John chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. I'm sure you know uh, verses uh, 16 by, by, by heart. Verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Verse 15. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
Hebrews chapter 9, verses 14, and we've already read it, says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, perfect, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And then 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 tells us, For Christ also suffered once for the sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. You know, Ellen G. White, in Desire of Ages, pages 25, and this is a quote that you and I know very well, says, Jesus was condemned for our sins, in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. You see, Christ's sacrifice in behalf of man was full and complete. The condition of the atonement had been fulfilled. The work for which Jesus had come to this world had been accomplished. So what else makes Jesus' sacrifice on the cross perfect? Well, Christ's death provided for full restoration. Let's look at it. It met the penalty of the broken law, death, and satisfied the requirements of justice, which demanded that sin received its full penalty, death. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 tells us that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ's death provided for the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 14 tells us, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience, from dead works to serve the living God. Christ's death provided for our reconciliation to God. And so Romans chapter 5 verses 10 tells us, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And yes, grass. Christ's death provides for our full restoration to oneness with God. Colossians, Paul, uh, Paul writing to the, uh, to, to the church of Colossae in Colossians, chapter 1, verses 19, 22, tells us, For it pleased the Father that in Jesus all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Christ's death provides for a full restoration. But Christ's death also is also a complete sacrifice. There is no need for, for it to be repeated as were the daily sacrifices of the Levitical priests. Paul makes this clear in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 to 20, 28, as we will see on Wednesday's lesson. Therefore, Jesus' sacrifice is perfectly effective and never to be surpassed. Jesus not only cleansed us from sin, but as we've read in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 to 14, he also provides sanctification by putting sin away from our lives. Jesus' sacrifice cleanses and consecrates us so that we may approach God with confidence and serve him as a royal priest would, as we were instructed to be. Jesus' sacrifice also provides nourishment for our 
spiritual life. It provides an example that we need to observe and follow. Thus, Hebrews invites us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, especially the events of the cross, and follow his lead. You see, the cross is the basis for all the benefits that God bestows upon us. It provides purification from sin. It provides sanctification to serve. And it provides nourishment for us to grow every day in Christ. There is no better experience than what we have been given in Jesus. It truly is the perfect sacrifice. They nailed the cross and the cost of forgiveness. That's Wednesday's lesson. Unpack that for us. Uh, when I first read that title, I thought, oh my goodness, what did they give me? <laughs> How am I going to measure the cost of forgiveness? Um, but I was getting ahead of myself. As I read the lesson, as I studied, I realized we were not really evaluating the immeasurable sacrifice of our Lord for us because it's almost like we probably will be unpacking that for eternity in heaven. But rather, we are looking at what it entailed for us to be forgiven and why. So Adam sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, and so have the rest of us. The result is simple. Sin brings death to the sinner, to Adam and Eve, to all of us, and on through the ages. Uh, could God just forgive us and just move on? That's the question. It's like to us, it's simplistic. It's like, okay, just... Uh, he could not do it and still stay true to his immutable, unchangeable, loving, yet fair character. Somehow there had to be a death payment for sin. Jesus, the Son of God, part of the Godhead would come to this earth, live in a, as a human being, yet sinless, and then die in our place to pay once and for all the death price for our sinning. But how exactly and how would God convey that to us? That's what we're looking at. As we've already studied on Monday with um, Mark, a complex system of sacrifices was set up both to teach and to provide a faith process, an avenue for those that lived before Christ would come to this earth and die, to learn and in faith participate and take a hold of that plan of salvation. Because for us, it's kind of after Christ died and already paid, it's kind of a lot clearer and easier for us to take a hold of that. But for them, they were looking in the future. So a quick summary of what Mark covered much more thoroughly. One, the burnt offering represented Jesus, whose life was going to be consumed for us. Two, the grain offering, Jesus, the sustenance of his people, the bread of life. Three, the peace or fellowship offering celebrated with family and friends represented Christ, whose sacrifice would provide peace to us. And four, the sin of purification offering pointed forward to the blood of Jesus who would die on the cross and redeem us for our sins. And five, the guilt offering provided forgiveness in cases where restitution could be made. In other words, telling the sinner that when we wronged someone, we did have a responsibility to provide reparation or restitution to those we have wronged. We can see how comprehensive God's plan was, uh, covering so many facets in that earthly sanctuary. And as we learned before, once a year, the Day of Atonement, um, there would be a symbolic cleansing of the earthly sanctuary or the temple. Also, as we have studied before, the Israelite temple with its sanctuaries, chambers, was a pattern of the one in heaven. The idea that the heavenly sanctuary needs cleansing in the context of the Old Testament sanctuary makes sense to us because the sanctuary is a symbol of God's government. How can we say that? Um, here's in 1 Samuel 4.4. 4. We're going to look at that text. So it's talking about the temple on earth. And it says, So the people went to Silo that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lords of Hosts, 
who dwells between the cherubim. And that's the idea we're underlining in this text, that they were bringing the ark back to the temple. And why? Because it was where the Lord would reside between the two cherubims. It was uh, his seat of government. Um, and so in 2 Samuel 6, it is the same, so we won't review it. It practically says the same thing. The Lord, the, uh, the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. Now, God's government is fair, vindicating the innocent and condemning the guilty. When God forgives the sinner's sin, he bears our sin. That's an interesting point, and we're going to look at the text that highlights that. Exodus 34, 7. It says, keeping mercy, it's talking about God, and God is a God of mercy, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now, the key word is that in here where it says forgiving, the word forgiving iniquity and transgression, the word forgiving is um, original in Hebrew, and our lesson actually points that out, noze, for it, it means caring or bearing. So just in the word forgiving, God says that when he forgives our sins, he bears our sins, which is a very interesting concept. So as God is forgiving our sins, he's carrying our sins, he's bearing our sins. Thus, as they are being carried in those, all those uh, sanctuary um, offerings that they were being made, they were being carried and buried in the sanctuary. So the temple needed to be cleansed once a year. At the end of the year, we know, and we've studied before on the Day of the Atonement, which was the Day of Judgment, God would cleanse the sanctuary, clearing his judicial responsibilities by transferring the sins from the sanctuary to the scapegoat Azazel, who represented Satan. Now, in Leviticus uh, 16, 20 to 22, it highlights this process, so I won't read it. We've read it before and we stu studied it. What's interesting to think about in this text and in, in this process of the Day of the Atonement those who confessed their sins during the year showed loyalty to God, like those that did the processes, by observing a solemn rite. So that the, on the Day of Atonement, they could rest. It's a day of judgment. They could rest. They knew they were being covered. Those who did not show loyalty and who did not go through those processes would be cut off. What is that reminiscent to? The final judgment. Satan and those who did not choose God would be cut off at the end of time. Those who obeyed God's instructions and showed loyalty to God would be fine. And I just want to close with a text from Revelation 21, 6 to 8. That is the assurance to us that going through these processes, like taking a hold of God, we would be fine. The Old Testament believers took a hold of God by in faith obeying and following through. But for us, God has buried our sins directly on the cross, and we will be covered by his blood. Revelation 21, 6 to 8. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. As I've been pondering and reviewing this entire step-by-step -step plan of what it took for our sins to be bared or carried by God, um, it just made me realize the incredible magnitude that, of sin and catch a bit more of the glimpse of God's love and effort on my behalf. Amen. Amen, Amen Danielle, and that's absolutely correct. And Mark, going into Thursday, and I'm so happy because Thursday really brings in the character of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Judgment, his love, his, his, his goodness. Amen. I mean, I, I, I start out with kind of a question to this, and it says, you know, how will God judge us 
as sinners. And I, I think we're going to live, I'm going to dig into it, but he's going to do it, of course, we've learned by his sacrifice that we've learned it. Also by the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Hebrews has some, from some teachings there that we're going to discuss about our part in this new covenant that he created. I want to start this out with um, kind of digging into the parable of the we wedding feast. Um, and this, um, and let's, we're going to first start the first part. I'm not going to go through the whole of it, but we'll go to the first part, and then we'll go to the second part. And we want to see our, where we are in this. And let's read Matthew 22, verses 1 and 2. And Jesus answered and spoke to them about the, by, by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And then I'm going to skip a little bit of the, the, the first part of this, but then I'm going to jump to the very end. And this is when everybody is invited to the wedding. And let's go to Matthew 22, verses 9 through 14. Therefore, go into the highways as, I have, as, as many as you find and invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man who did not have a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the servant, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into the outer, outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. You see this man, the wedding is, of course, the second coming of Jesus, our, our decision, the judgment. The man, this man was not prepared for the wedding. And so that's the thing. As sinners, how do we prepare for this? We are will. We'll still be prepared. What do we do? Well, the good news is, the greatest news is, is that we just have to have faith in Jesus Christ. Romans, and Victor's mentioned this already, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and 26. I want to read this again and say what we need is the first part is this belief. By now, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed by witness, by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ to all and to all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is Jesus Christ, whom God set forth as a probation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because of his forbearance, God has passed over all over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that we might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Amen. We're all sinners. We just have to have faith in Jesus Christ. Also, Romans, uh, and we have to believe that he is our Savior. That is how we prepare for this wedding that Jesus has promised, that Jesus talked about. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, it says some more. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for anyone who believes, for the, Jew, for the Jew and also for the Greek, for it is the righteousness of God is revealed by faith to faith, as it is written, they shall live by faith. He also asks us to live by faith. That's also how we prepare. The other one is Romans 5.8, by his blood we are saved. By God demonstrated in his own blood towards us, in that which we are still sinners, God, Christ died for us. In addition to that, in addition to knowing that we're sinners, and, but he's, we have to have faith in him, he also gave us the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And first I'll talk about Ezekiel, who, who prophesied about this, and then we'll dig into Hebrews and what they say about it. Ezekiel 26 verses um, 25 and 27 says this, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your f f filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, mm -hmm. that you will keep my commandments and do them. And Hebrews chapter 8 Verses 8 through 12 also talks about this. For this is the covenant that will, I will make with the house of Israel for all those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall need to teach their neighbor nor their brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me 
from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their righteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So, you know, so that's it. But Hebrews also points out that to be ready for this judgment day, for ready for that wedding, Hebrews has some nice lessons from us. And we're in Hebrews, so I'm going to start out in Hebrews first, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and, and read that, and we'll, we'll see what it says here. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through the angels proved food steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed by us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. It says right there, be earnest in our things that we know we have heard. Number, uh, Hebrews 6 verses 2 talks about bringing people into the fold. Therefore, um, by doctrine of baptism and laying on of hands, it also talks about prayer, bringing people on the fold. Um, laying on of hands uh, of resurrection of the dead and of the eternal judgment. And then also Hebrews 9 through 27 and 28, it talks about that we need to eagerly wait for his return. And it is appointed for man to die once, but after this judgment, so Christ also offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly await for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. And then finally in Hebrews 10 verses 23 and 25, it talks about this steadfast hope. Let us hold fast in confessions of our hope without wavering, for he has promised, for he who had promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of others together. It is the manner of son, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. So I read from Hebrews that to be prepared for this wedding, he wants us to be earnest in that belief to constantly be helping others, bring people into the fold as we can, to teach others about it. Ellen White brings it very nicely and concludes this very nicely in Testimonies of Church, uh, Volume 5, pages 471 and 472. Right at the very end, it says right here, man cannot meet these charges himself. We are sinners, okay, she says. In, this sin sta in his sin-stained garments, confessing his guilt, he stands before God. But Jesus, our advocate, presents an effectual plea on behalf of all, though, all who, by repentance and faith, have committed the keeping of our souls to him. Amen. He, Jesus, pleads our case and vanquishes the accuser by the mighty arguments of Calvary. His perfect obedience to God's law even under death of cross, has given him all power in heaven and earth, and he claims of the Father's mercy and reconciliation for the guilty man. But while we should realize our sinful condition, yes, we are sinners, we are to rely upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. We cannot answer the charges that Satan will bring against us. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf, he is able to silence the accuser with arguments founded not upon our merits, but upon his own. And Ellen White just, it was, a, it was a great message there. Yeah, thank Thanks you. so much, Mark. Um, Danielle, do you have any final thoughts? Um, I just wanted to kind of summarize. I was, we were looking at all these parts of the plan of salvation today, of course, from the book of Hebrew and from other parts of the Bible. And as I was looking at why were sacrifices needed, and in my lesson I was focusing on um, the cross and what it entailed uh, to be saved for this plan of salvation to put into motion, what it took, all the steps. All these years as a Christian, I've, I've been, I've accepted that the Lord humbled himself, that he's come to this world, and that he's... Uh, sacrificed his life for me. He first that he lived a sinless life and then he died a life of the sinner for me and always focusing on the cross and learning the, the parts. But this lesson just really, really kind of brought it home and clear of what incredible detail got put to this plan. Amen. 
because we were looking somewhat comprehensively. We spent time before in other lessons where we looked at little parts of this from the old sanctuary, but we kind of put it all together in this lesson, and it just made me realize that there isn't anything that could take this plan away from me. God has covered it completely. There is no part uncovered, and it's just an invitation for all of us to be partakers of it, and I'm wanting to close with um, Revelation 22, verses 13 and 14, where it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. Mark, any yep. final thoughts? You know, uh, we learned about this, you know, reminded again, of course, this great sacrifice of Jesus there. And, you know, um, what, I, what I learned simply is that God wants us to just continually be working towards that relationship with mm -hmm. him. You know, and the things we learn in Hebrews about have faith and have hope and help others and be earnest in your knowledge, it all comes down to that his desire for us as our part of the covenant to just be constantly reaching out, finding and connecting with him, bringing others to him. And I think that's a wonderful story. I, I really want to thank you both immensely. I enjoy teaching with both of you. You are thank profound, you and I, I want to thank you. You know, I, I really want to um, provide final thoughts that come from uh, the spirit of prophecy today. And I want to encourage you, if you can, to, to, to really go back to desires, Desire of Ages and reflect on two incredible chapters, Calvary and It is Finished. Ellen G. White in... Uh, Desire of Ages, pages 755 and 756. Paints this incredible picture and makes a call to you and to me. And I want to close with that, with those statements. So I'm going to read those. And you, you, you're going to have uh, those on screen, so I would love you to accompany me. Here's how she says. The, splot, the spotless Son of God hung upon the cross, his flesh lacerated with stripes, those ends so often reached out in blessings, nailed to the wooden bars, those feet so tireless on ministries of love, spiked to the tree, the royal head pierced by the crown of thorns, those quivering lips shaped to the cry of woe, and all that Christ endured, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his hands, his feet, the agony that wrecked his frame, the un Hutterable anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face speaks to each child of humanity, declaring, It is for you, it is for me, that the Son of God consents to bear this burden of guilt. For you, he spoils the domain of death and opens the gates of paradise. He who still the hungry waves and walked the foam-capped billows, who made devils tremble and disease flee, who opened blind eyes and called forth the dead to life, offers himself upon the cross as a sacrifice. And this, for, and this from love for you and love for me. He, the sin bearer, endures the wrath of divine justice and for our sake becomes sin itself. You know, the cross is a demonstration of God's amazing grace, of his mercy and his justice 
for you and for me. I'm going to ask Daniel, would you please close in prayer? Dear Lord, as we contemplated in this lesson, the incredible gift you through the ages looked forward with every step that you put in place, every offering that was given, every sinner that came to your altar in the Old Testament, and every believer that reaches out to you, reached out to you in that time, you could see, you knew the ultimate sacrifice you were going to give. It wasn't a secret to you. Yet, Lord, with incredible love and incredible thoughtfulness, step by step, moment by moment, you built up to that incredible moment when you offered yourself on the cross for us. And then the plan continued and continues with every step and all the way to the day when you will be returning to take us home with you. Lord, our comprehension is limited, but we could see all this today in this lesson pointed out and underlined, and it touched our hearts. Lord, please Forgive us for our incapability to comprehend it all. But thank you for your love and for preparing it all step by step and bring it all to fruition. We're looking forward to the day when we will see you face to face and we will be with you in heaven celebrating in eternity and studying all this plan and the gift that you've given us in detail. Lord, as we are um, finishing this lesson, we ask that your, these moments that we spent in study would stay with us and in our hearts and minds, guiding us and helping us always remember that you are on our side and have always been and always would be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Victor. Thank Danielle. you so much for being with us today. I hope this lesson was meaningful. Have Happy a Sabbath. Wonderful day. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.